Atlanta delivered another all-time classic finish. We have to talk about it. Very rarely do we get one of those have you ever, no I've never type of moments in NASCAR anymore. Sure, we had it in 2003 at Darlington when Larry and Darrow had their famous call. 2011 Talladega, closest finish in NASCAR history, two one thousandths of a second. What we saw on Sunday night was unprecedented, essentially. A three wide battle for the lead coming to the line, three one thousandths of a second separating Daniel Suarez, his margin of victory over Ryan Blaney. Seven one thousandths of a second separating the top three. Absolutely insane. That alone would have been in the ninth closest finish in NASCAR Cup Series history. And instead, we get the third closest finish ever. A three-wide battle, very much Cars movie-esque like finish. Nobody stuck their tongue out to try to trip the uh, the timing line right there. And we're not having a one-race uh, champion winner-take-all next week in California. Regardless, Daniel Suarez picks up his second career NASCAR Cup Series victory in maybe the most unlikely of places. I don't think anybody thought Daniel Suarez was going to win that race, especially after getting caught up in a lap two incident, uh, which took out like half the field, basically, or at least damaged half the field. And then he rebounds and comes away with the victory, which is massive for him considering he's on the hot seat, right? Trackhouse already has uh, Zane Smith and Shane Van Gisbergen signed for deals, and they both want to get to the Cup Series. They both want to be in that Trackhouse car. Obviously, Zane Smith is already in the Cup Series, but he wants to be with Trackhouse. He wants to be at that company, not, you know, the satellite team over at Spire. And you can't blame him. Daniel Suarez knows he has to win. And everybody thought Suarez was signed through 2025. And Justin Marks kind of cleared that up in the post-race press conference on Sunday saying that, you know, it's a contract year for Suarez, which is interesting because a lot of times people don't talk contracts like that. But for Suarez, I mean, Max Verstappen's potential future brother-in-law went out there and got one. He's locked himself into the playoffs this year. I don't know if anybody had him actually making the playoffs because he was so disappointing last year in 2023. Meanwhile, his teammate Ross Chastain continues to impress everybody. But I guess we have to talk about Atlanta overall. That finish was all time. And the Jeff Gluck was it a good race poll that he posted on Monday morning currently sits at 95% yes. I voted yes as well. I think that there's this was the tale of two halves because I started writing my was it a good race script for my video or at least putting my thoughts down and at the moment when I started writing this about halfway through the race I was like this race is a 55 60 I know there's a ton of people that are like this race was great top to bottom and I completely am fine with people having that opinion. At the end of the day, super speedway drafting style tracks like this, they're not necessarily my favorite. Daytona and Talladega do it for me. I think those are fine. Atlanta being this weird mile and a half hybrid of the two, it doesn't really entice me that much um, because at the end of the day, I loved old Atlanta. I love tire wear. I love throttle management. I love drivers having to absolutely wheel these cars. That's not to say that the drivers didn't wheel these cars on Sunday because they were making some insane moves out there. And I think that what we saw was pretty good top to bottom. Is it a little bit artificial because of the package that's on the car? Yes. Is that fine? Also, yes. But I know it's not my cup of tea necessarily. Was I entertained? For sure. But at the end of the day, I can still be entertained, but also be like, man, I really miss watching these guys go out there and try to absolutely manhandle these cars. So I think it's a balance. But in the first half of this race, I was not that impressed with it. Tons of crashes, tons of bad moves, a lot of really stupid people stupid judgments you know people trying to fit in holes where they're not there and you know it was a much better improvement over what we saw on saturday between the truck series and the xfinity series that xfinity series race don't even bother taking xfinity back to atlanta in 2025 if that's going to be the show that they put on because that race was a snoozer on the break hard was it a good race scale that was the 2016 coke 600 because i put everybody to sleep there was nothing, nothing entertaining about that. Meanwhile, the cup race, banger. Certified banger? Uh, based on the Jeff Gluck poll, yeah, you can give it that. Am I going to give it that? Eh, probably not. I would say that this race definitely banged. It was good. It was good top to bottom. Again, I know my personal preference is going to, you know, sway the scale here when I give it a rating. But overall, you had 14 different leaders, 48 lead changes, the most ever for Atlanta Motor Speedway, obviously because of the reconfigure and going to this style of racing. Todd Gillen, Todd Gillen in a front row motorsport car led the most laps with 57. Insane that you even have that. You have a three wide battle to the finish there coming to the line. Great move 
overall. You had a lot of comers and goers. You had guys that got caught up in Rex early, and they managed to come back and still get top tens. Michael McDowell crashed coming on the pit road with William Byron, hit nosed it into the wall. He rebounded for an eighth place finish. Josh Berry got a speeding penalty uh, while serving his speeding penalty. And before he wrecked out at the end of the race, he had made it all the way back up to eighth. There was a lot of coming and going in this race, and I absolutely love that aspect of it as well. Strategy-wise, it wasn't certainly wasn't Daytona level of strategy, which I think is a good thing. It'll, if we could make Daytona be what Atlanta was, where these guys are just going out there, basically balls to the wall, 85% throttle or more for the entire race, yeah, give that to us every single time. There's got to be a solution uh, to come into that, but we're not going to talk about Daytona right now. Overall, the race was good. Chase Briscoe was out there driving like he was ready to meet God at multiple points, and I tweeted out, this race doesn't end without Chase Briscoe crashing. Uh, there, or it's going to take a miracle for Chase Briscoe to finish this race because he was trying to crash, and there were no miracles to be had because he did eventually crash there. Denny Hamlin spun out. Single car spins were bringing out cautions. We had a two-car wreck coming to pit road with William Byron and Michael McDowell did not bring a caution. I don't... Let me say this. I like when NASCAR holds cautions because sometimes cautions don't actually warrant a caution. In this situation, when you have two cars crashing coming onto pit road, one of those cars is sitting right next to the racing line on the apron trying to get it refired while cars are going by at 170, 180 mile an hour. Didn't love that from a safety standpoint. Meanwhile, you have single car spins like the Denny Hamlin one where I'm like, okay, that shouldn't have been a caution. Like, just get it fired up and, and go again. Who cares if it's Denny Hamlin and he falls lap down or whatever. They, maybe they just didn't want him to go onto his podcast Monday and complain about it. But there was there were some iffy, iffy strategy call or caution calls there. Not strategy. The strategy wasn't really that big of a factor. You did have multiple teams flipping stages, which I thought was entertaining. And then, of course... I have to look at my notes because there's so much happening here. Rasha Stain spins out Chase Elliott. He's probably going to have to go kiss that Hendrick ring once again. So the Don of the Chevy camp continues to make sure that, you know, they get cars that are fast. And then you have Todd Gillen, super relevant. Again, I, I can't say enough about how impressive he was, at least at commanding the race. Albeit, he definitely caused that first or that second lap incident where he backed off down the front stretch, backed off on the straightaway to try to let his teammate get in. That accordion affected behind him and then caused that huge melee into turn one. That wasn't ideal for him. Joey Logano, obviously, he got the penalty pre race for his gloves. And we'll just talk about that right now. Obviously, people have a lot to say about the gloves. I'm going to put a glove on here so we can talk about this real quick. Maybe wearing a black shirt with a black glove, not my best idea I've ever had. But Logano, if I hold it right here. Okay, we can see it here. Logano had webbing between his thumb and his index finger right here. So when he was driving on his left hand only, he could put his hand up against the window net. That creates more surface right here. That can stop the air from coming into the cockpit, thus reducing drag on the car and maybe pick him up a thousandth of a second or something. NASCAR wasn't happy about that. One, because they don't want that to happen. Two, he modified racing safety equipment. His gloves are SFI rated. Adding that piece of material and that threading makes it not SFI rated anymore. NASCAR doesn't know if that is flame retardant material or thread. Who knows? If he gets into a crash, does that just flame up and now burns his hand? Does that thread go in and burn his hand? It's a safety issue. And I know there's a ton of people on the internet, a lot of mouth breathers that are very upset. And they're like, this is why NASCAR is dying. This is why nobody watches NASCAR. You must be fun at parties if you think safety is that important. Yeah, safety is super important. NASCAR has always made a stand, has always taken the stance that safety is the priority. Since 2001, when they were like, we need to get our stuff together, now it's it's super important. They don't mess around with it, and they shouldn't because it's more, it's more than just the glove. It's more than just Joey Logano. It's a liability issue. Of course, they want to take it seriously. So NASCAR sent Logano to the rear and then made him do a pass-through, which would have been really detrimental if that caution hadn't come out on the freaking second lap and then you know not put him a lap down. So he... Ends up coming out of that first caution period, running 20th. Served his penalty, still ran 20th, and then he eventually got caught up. He says that he pushed up down the backstretch. Maybe it was a late block. Maybe he did push up. Regardless, his race was over once again. Brad Keselowski took himself out. So all the big players that generally cause wrecks did all take themselves out. Briscoe, Keselowski, uh, uh, Logano. Blanked out there for a second. Todd Gillen had maybe one of the funniest lines of the day. 
where he's like, this is a lot like going to a haunted house. And he's like, I'm excited, but I'm also scared for my life. And he's right, because it was wild out there. Kyle Larson actually looked competent on a super speedway race until he got taken out by that Brad Keselowski wreck. And he got out and said, that was the most fun I've ever had on a drafting track. And I think that says a lot. Do we need to see more Atlantas? No. I There's growing speculation that Texas is going to be turned into Atlanta. Don't love that. The only way I do love that is if Atlanta moves one of their dates to the fairgrounds if that ever happens. And then that second super speedway date that Atlanta typically had is now just in Texas. So we'll have to wait and see on that. But yeah, Marcus Smith gets to take a victory lap today because they delivered an all-time finish at that track. And we'll see how it continues to age. At the end of the day, if people were entertained, that's really what it comes down to. Now, there, there's maybe some people that tuned in from the Netflix show that then tuned into Atlanta or Daytona and then Atlanta. And they're like, this style of racing is insane. We're going to go to Vegas next week. And if it's anything like the spring Vegas last year, they might not be coming back for Phoenix. Well, man, Phoenix is bad in itself. So actually, maybe we should have spaced these out a little bit. Regardless, NASCAR absolutely got every piece of marketing material they needed for the playoffs. The Atlanta starts the playoffs this year, in case anyone forgot. And guess what? We got a clip that we're going to be seeing for the next 15 years. And I'm not mad about it at all. I still love seeing that Kurt Busch, Ricky Craven clip, because who doesn't like to see that? Now we're going to see this every time we go to Atlanta, like that time Matt Kenseth ran into the barrels coming onto pit road at Dover 20 years ago. And we still talk about how difficult Dover pit road is to get onto. We're going to be talking about how close this finish was because of what the new Atlanta provides. At the end of the day, solid race top to bottom. If I was going to score it, again, I feel like it's got to be scored in two halves because the first half of this race stunk. I was not entertained by it at all. I was like, this race is taking forever. I mean, it took an hour and 15 minutes to run the first 60 laps of this race. That's way too long. Way, way too long. So the first half of this race, I'd probably give it like a 55. That's what I put down in my notes here. The second half of this race, I'd probably give it a 90 because it was entertaining. There's still some things that you can change up. And I don't like if we're going to score the finish too, that's finish probably gets a 98 or 99 out of 100. And people are going to be like, what else do you want? Well, I mean, it's not the closest finish in NASCAR history, so we can't exactly give it that. So end of the day. Solid race, entertained. I'm interested to see how it does in the playoffs, especially with a warmer, slicker track. Obviously, last year, what we saw um, from this race in the playoffs wasn't necessarily what we saw in the springtime. So this year, the springtime race resulted in 6,500 green flag passes. Green flag pa passes are not the best metric to measure by, but we're just doing it right now because it's easy. The fall race last year had just under 5,000. So there's some things to be said about how much this track changes from the spring to the fall. Spring race last year had 6,000. The fall race in 2022 had 4,600. So you can expect a bit of a fall off when you get to the summer race just because it's a little bit slicker. However, it's not in July like it was the previous two years. It will now be later into the season into, what, I guess August, September. I forgot September existed. So there's that. September 8th, they'll be back in, and it's going to be it's gonna be hot. So we'll wait and see. Either way, let me know in the comments, did you like this race? What do you think about the Logano penalty? Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at BreakHard, Instagram and Twitter at BreakHardBlog.